Let me check the timer. There we are. We are live. I am very happy to be here with Dr. Trey Rogers. Doctor, thank you for coming on the show. It's uh, been uh, anxious to talk to you based off the friend, mutual friends that connect us. But before we get into today's discussion, I want to tell everybody out there a little bit about you because not everyone is familiar with the agronomy side of the industry. And uh, so Dr. John Rogers, better known as Trey, uh, to his friends in the industry, is a professor of turf grass management in the Department of Plant, Soil, and Microbial Sciences at Michigan State University and has been on faculty there since 1988. He is a native of Arkansas and grew up working at the Hard Scrabble Country Club in Fort, uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. It's a hell of a name for a country club, by the way. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Science in Agronomy at University of Arkansas in 1982 and returned to be the Assistant Superintendent at Hard Scrabble, Hard Scrabble Country Club in 1982 and three. Returned to University of Arkansas and earned his Master's of Science in Agronomy in 1985 and a PhD in Agronomy from Penn State yeah, in 1988. Uh, since 1988, he has advised and graduated over a thousand students. Current turf grass research interests at Michigan State include performance turf renovations, turf grass established, and soil modification. Served as a lead scientist for the indoor, indoor turf project at the Pontiac Silverdome for the 1994 World Cup, soccer matches, and project leader of the Spartan Stadium turf grass conversion in 2001 and 2. Also a turf consultant, project leader for the 2004-2008 Summer and Olympic Games and the 2008 UEFA Cup. You consult on courses, athletic fields, turf grass matters, and extensive uh, are extensive throughout the United States as well as around the world. China, Greece, Japan, the Dominican, Argentina, Brazil, Australia, Wales, England, and Spain. <laughs> this is a hell of a resume you've got here. Uh, national and international okay. lectures and presentations are a uh, total over 185 with 115 publications and a book. Uh, you are the senior author of two U.S. patents and national organizations include the American Society of Agronomy and the Crop Science Society of America. Uh, gee, that's almost a book in itself. You've been a pretty busy person over your career. Well, if you think about it, that's 36 years. So that's, you know, you, you get a little bit there, but that's um, very flattering. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, you know, this has always been, it, you know, the, the, the name of the podcast is Golf 360. And I named it that because I wanted to talk to a wide array of people throughout the industry, not just pigeon hold myself. I'm a coach, you know, I teach. I just didn't want to talk to coaches all the time because that would get boring. I'd run out of people pretty quick. So it, the, the, the name is hence Golf 360. So it's 360 degrees of the whole industry or anything that touches it. But I have always been fascinated since I was a kid and was caddying at how people in your side of the business can take a golf course that is, you know, it's green and it's nice and everything, but come like a member guest or a club championship or an event, all of a sudden the fairways are striped or they're checkerboarded and you've got, you know, you grow the rough to frame it and the greens are done unbelievably well. And, and the difference at such a low level of grass from the green to the fringe, second cuts and et cetera. But it's almost like you're artists. Um, so I don't know if, if you and people in the industry view yourself as such. I know you're in, you've done research, and I believe you're more of a researcher since your superintendent days. But would you consider that side of the business a, a, an artistic, as long as in unison with the scientific side, which you're you've been in mostly? I think one of the first things that you hear, learn from anybody who teaches turfgrass science or in or mentors someone in turfgrass golf course maintenance is that this is an art and a science, right? I mean, you know, you. I love to hear that word that uh, superintendents like to throw around. Uh, Carl Olson was great at it. He was a former USGA agronomist and then worked at National Golf Links. He called it presentation. How do we present this golf course? And I think there's a lot of, that's a word that's used by a lot of people. And so it does have an art. And it does, but it also has a science component to it. So that uh, you know how the the soil and the turf grass uh, work together, along with the moisture that's in both those, both the soil and the grass itself. So that's one of the things that you know when you come to school, uh, we teach the science. We when we send the students out on the internships, that's when they're learning the art. You know, we're not the artists. I always tell the kids when they first day, I say, I don't give a damn how straight a line you mow. I just need you to know why you're mowing and what the <laughs> importance of it is. And how the fact that by having where where mowing frequency lies 
in the importance in the hierarchy of having an outstanding golf course. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things that you like about that strike, one of the things you like about that member guest, one of the things that you thought was impressive, but you might not have known that since Monday, even though you saw it on a Friday, that patch of turf had been mowed 12 times, 12 times in four days, whereas on a normal week, it might be mowed twice. And so, you know, anytime you're seeing that, you know, on a tournament on a TV, you know, you're, they're seeing the intensity really, really ramp up as opposed to a normal week. And so that's, um, it's been always, you know, it's impressive. It really is. It's, but it's not something that is normally sustainable, right? From both the, uh, from both the, the grasses standpoint, you know, it can't be mowed four or five times a day, not very well. And then also the labor standpoint. Yeah, so you'd have work. to have a, a pretty big budget to be running four uh, well, times a day over the same fairway. Um, just, man think hours. About the, just think about the poor guy. I mean, if I told you, you got to, oh, by the way, you're going to loop three times five days in a row. You'd say, I don't think so. <laughs> right? And that's the same thing that happens here. So. You know, that's that's it's really what's fascinating about the industry because, you know, being here long enough is that, you know, that intensity, that mowing, that frequency of mowing, we've known for a long time how important that is. But to actually be able to get out there and do it, relatively impossible on a long term basis until until robotic mowing came along. Hmm. And now that it's here in a big, big way. And. um the sky is the limit now in the type of conditions you can provide. So you you watch over the next five years what happens to some of these uh, these golf, golf courses and athletic courses. They'll really take off. What what, what would what is the, the main difference between the, the way that things have been mowed traditionally and then the robotic mowing? Not so much. I mean, the robot is, is you know, just like the little rum. You, you, if you look down at it, it looks like the little rumba uh, mower that, or the vacuum cleaner right that you see mm -hmm. except it's got a uh, a very sophisticated set of razor blades underneath there that are mowing but i you know because i can set it on a you know set it on a track or set it up in an area and it will mow that area specifically that one acre or that two acres or that two and a half acres it will mow it as many times as i want it to mow it in a day as long as it can go back and charge but if I can get it mowed every day, I'm never cutting very much of the leaf blade off anymore. So now all of a sudden, I'm going to increase its density. And if I increase its density, the ball's going to sit up better. Mm -hmm. ball sits up better, player's going to like it more. Now, I don't know if they ever use it in the U.S. Open, but I can promise you at the country club of Lansing, on a Sunday afternoon in June, I'm not going to lose a golf ball on the right side of 12 because we haven't been able to mow there since Friday morning. You know, so all of a sudden, you know, uh, we don't lose a golf ball. Somebody doesn't lose a golf ball. They are pretty happy. They stay around, have dinner, have a couple of drinks. Club does better, mm -hmm. right? So I see this stuff is really, really taking off. And, I, and you know, we, we know that the frequency of mowing contributes directly to density. So let me flip it around now on, on athletic fields. If you think about a high school athletic field, one of the first things somebody says, well, the reason we have to have artificial turf is because we can't have anybody maintain this. We can't even get anybody to mow this thing three or four days a week. Well, that's out the window now, hmm. right? That's gone. That excuse is gone. So now my ability to have this increased density is right there, right there in front of everybody. So... You know, I was just having this conversation this morning with somebody, and they were talking about you know, where did I see this thing going? Because they were kind of lamenting that it's difficult to fight the artificial turf companies. You know, they've got a lot of, you know, they've got a lot of ammunition. It's easy for schools to say, throw their hands up in the air. We don't have that. I said, I don't disagree. I've fought this thing for 20 years, but now we got a little, little robot coming along. But all of a sudden, it changes the game a little bit. So I'm very excited about that. I've been I've been watching robotic mowing since 1997, but they've just now got it to where it will it can do what we want it to do 
at a relatively low price, safe, not going to run into anybody. And we don't even know that much about it yet. I mean, my prediction is, is that by keeping this plant healthier, we'll use less fertilizer, we'll use less water, we'll use less chemicals. Then all of a sudden, you know, you can see all kinds of benefits from this. People love to say, well, you know, maybe we'll use less labor. No, you don't use less labor. You just direct the labor somewhere else. Mm. So now all of a sudden for the same price, you've got a better golf course. So, I, could ju- I could just imagine in, in, in the earlier days when they were trying to get maybe the, I'm assuming it's run off as some sort of GPS to put the coordinates in of, of the, 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 what it's trying yeah, to, but right. I could, ju- I could just, right. Right. Yeah, I could just imagine that in the early days, it, if the coordinates were slightly skewed or something tripped on the, on the, in the technology that, that, that <laughs> Roomba cutting goes off on a uh, rogue and it's cutting all over the golf course or, or all over the field. That could have right, been yeah, pretty interesting that, to see. And- <laughs> that and you know it's still not foolproof i mean if if your golf course is uh if, like up in northern michigan and it's lined with trees it's not gonna work very well because of the reception yeah mm-hmm. so it still can't do that i mean you know it can it can work around you know trees a tree a couple of trees but it can't run, work around 80 trees so but that's today that's today you know the, the, what do you know i mean Take a look at that phone that we all live by. No kidding. And then what kind of phone we had 20 years ago. Now, if we'd all said 20 years ago, bag this phone, I don't want this phone. This is the dumbest thing ever. I'm just going to keep with my landline. Well, you wouldn't have what's in your hand today. Well, so this, this moves forward. And this has been the world that I've been in my whole life, is watching turf grass move forward, watching people come up with ideas. I know you had Tim Morgan on there talking with Tim about what the issues were and coming back, thinking about it, designing studies to maybe answer problems. So it's been, it's been wonderful for me. That, that, that's interesting that you say that, that, that you can cut a fair, for example, a fairway with, with the robot, that it can cut it shorter. Most people would think uh, that aren't in your industry or just amateurs out there would think if you cut it shorter, it becomes more susceptible to disease or, or things like that. But you're saying, no, it becomes healthier because it, it becomes more dense. So it's, it's, it's growing more because, laterally than it is vertically? Yeah, because spreading. what you're doing is by mowing every day instead of mowing, like if I mow once a week, let's say, let's just take a height of cut and I, let's say it's one inch. And if I mow once a week, then when I get back to it on Sunday, it's going to be three and a half inches tall. And I'm going to cut it back to one inch. And that's going to be what's called scalping. Mm-hmm. And nothing is worse for a grass than any, than that. That's what I watch homeowners do every Sunday morning, you know. <laughs> and you know, and then they complain about why they have weeds in the yard. But but with the robotic mowing, if it gets to one inch, the next day it's gonna be an inch and a quarter and we're cutting it back to an inch. Then the next day it's gonna be an inch and a quarter, we're cutting it back to an inch. And that's what's gonna promote density of that plant. That plant will actually start to grow laterally out. And that is because of that, you know, you know, because all you gotta do is think about. Uh, you walk out to Tiger Stadium or any baseball park, and that's mowed at an inch, and you think, wow, that looks really good. But you do know they mowed it six days a week, just like they know they mow that green seven days a week. But they don't mow the rough seven days a week. No. But now they can. Well, that, that's not can. good for golf. <laughs> they don't want the rough thicker. That, yeah, but the ball sits up when it's thicker. Mm. It's not taller. Sticker. So, like for bluegrass roughs, by having a nice dense rough, there's nothing better than density. Uh, so, d- down here, you, you might get argument in the Bermuda section of the country that says, "No, yeah. we, we, that, that ball gets or that rough gets thick, and that thing sinks to the bottom." Now you really got a problem. I don't disagree there. And so they'll probably <laughs> mow it, may mow it a little shorter, but yep, it's quite interesting. What the, what are the some of the more misconceptions uh, about a healthy turf be it on a, in a golf course or on a football soccer baseball field uh wh- wh- where do you see most most getting it wrong or people's misconceptions would it be a long cutting it more I, I, that start, have to... starts with mowing that really you know that the, it's really mowing frequency you know the more you mow the better off things are and of course it's difficult to get mowing that much and the other thing is you know when you're fertilizing you feed a little a little you know on a, again on frequency 
instead of, you know, and I use the analogy, if I gave you the food that you have to eat on the first day of every month and said, I'll see you again a month from now, you'd get really pretty hungry by the time we got to about the seventh of the month. Yeah, no kidding. But if I give you food every day, then you do fine. And so, you know, those are the those are the things that, that that's a couple of things right there. I mean, the other thing is that is the the fact that you know I think most people would argue, and and I would just that the, one of the strongest or the most difficult things to do is to water a golf course correctly. Okay, and so now you're kind of watching uh, the way these greens get built. The, they're working very hard on firmness. And one of the ways that they can make it firm is by controlling that water. And so in the construction is where the key is for these people as to how to be able to control the water at the surface, keep the surface firm, and have a, uh, you know, and have control that they're wanting. How do you do that uh, where you keep the firmness at the top without would that have to do with thatch layers and verticutting and uh, all that that? all that plays a role but i think in the if you start with the construction side of things it it, you know if you think about things are made out of sand and we have what's called the united states golf association uh, putting green Mm -hmm. which is a 12 inch sand profile layered over a gravel layer and if it's a flat field that water behaves pretty nicely but we don't have flat greens. We've got greens that are normally tilting from back to front, such that the front of greens, and if, if you play go, you play golf, obviously, you know that when you hit a shot into the front of the green, if it doesn't carry far enough, it's going to hit right on the front. It's very wet on the front, and what's it going to do? Spin back. Yep. Everybody knows it, and nobody likes it. Well, you know what? Well, what has been done at Michigan State University was a research project to deter- to evaluate what would happen if we change the depth of the front of that green from being a 12-inch profile to a 16-inch profile. Now, it doesn't change the amount of water that goes down to that green, to the front of that green. But what it does is when you get back up to the surface, it stays drier. And by staying drier, ball is going to react more like it would on the rest of the green. And we call that a varied depth green. And uh, you're starting to see those go in the last, since about 2012, you started to see them go in more and more and more. The uh, PGA Tour is going to uh, build a very depth, a set of very depth greens in Memphis. Um, here for the one where they have the, uh, you know, one of the FedEx Cup um, mm-hmm. events. And then, uh, so. You know, um, and then lots of golf courses around the country have done this, but the one that's probably going to really be on display will be this one. So, again, it's just that technology, and 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 it's quite nice to say that that project was done at Michigan State. So we're very happy with that. D- does that allow the firmness? Because as you said, it went from 12 inch depth to 16, so that, that the water can be drawn down out of that. It goes from 12 inches to 16 inches. Yes. Yeah, so, so it, does that allow the water to to uh, be absorbed and get through the soil quicker and, and out the bottom? Not necessarily. Think about it as a, by making it deeper, it's just a reservoir. But up at the up at the top, the plant doesn't need any of the water that's at the bottom. The plant's only using the water that's in the top four or five inches. Mm-hmm. But if I have, if that front stays wet because all that water slides down to the front of the green because it's going through lateral flow, then I'm going to have a problem. So now if all of a sudden I make that 16 inches deep or even 20 inches deep, like I, we did in the project at Medina, because the architect gives us very slope, very false front type of green, then, um, you know, you've heard people talk about using a TDR to measure soil moisture, a meter, soil moisture meter. In theory, you should be able to go all the way around that green and get the same moisture level. Well, on a regular USGA green, there's no possible way to do that because the front of the green is going to be wet. But if you build the very depth green, like we're talking about, those will all be the same moisture because what what we haven't discussed yet is humps of greens, teardrops, things of that nature. You don't build them at 12 inches root zone. You build them at 8 inches of root zone so that they don't dry out. They stay a little bit wetter. 
Now, if you are the golf course superintendent or you're working on this golf course, you think these are one of the you think this is one of the greatest things ever. Because all you want is a level playing field. And the level playing field is give me a green that I can manage. That I'm not worried about the front of the green always being wet. I'm not dragging a hose up on top of the green to dry off to water a mound that's always staying dry. But by varying these depths on these greens, I get I get the even moisture soil moisture in the top two or three inches and the player's happy because they get a consistent bounce and the superintendent's happy or the manager's happy because it's a much easier green to manage. That's interesting how you bring that up, that this technology, because I would have to think that architects are going to be very happy that, that this is now available because it can modify as they work with superintendents I, I would have to think so that if you're going to design a golf course you want to know how the people are going they to but yep. they have to like it because it gives them more uh variables or things to do with the green well and they they certainly don't worry as much about uh i say building crazy greens because uh <laughs> we can drain them and uh, or we can build them and we just finished the one at medina three which was the, the oem boys and where they're going to play the president's cup and that is one moving set of greens right there. I mean, so. It, when you look at older architecture and uh, older McKenzie courses, and I know in, uh, what's the Crystal Downs, uh, right? Northern Michigan, and yeah. you know, obviously the famous one, Augusta National, but uh, him or, or even Donald Ross greens, like he, here in, in Savannah is a half hour from me and we'll go play like Savannah Golf Club is a Ross. And I think the military base, Bacon Park, I think there's four Ross courses over there. But you, you look at the, the humps and the curves in those greens going way back, you know, 70, 80, 100 years ago. Right. Did, did, what, did, they, did they come up with anything back then that, that allowed them to do something similar that just got lost over the decades? Or did they have it where, no, you hit the front and you're stuck and you fly it too far and you're bouncing over? Well, they didn't have irrigation back then, right? I mean, the, the irrigation systems they had back then were came from the sky anything. and so you know there's a lot of time when you'd hit into that you're hitting into dirt no matter what okay. so you know so any, any of that could be true but at the same time you bring up one of my favorite sayings is there's no such thing as a new idea there's only technology to carry the original one forward so even this very depth dream i can go into a book and show you where somebody thought of this but he or she didn't have the they didn't have the technology to carry it forward. Actually, there's a uh, F.W. Taylor out of Philadelphia. I can show you some drawings that he had. It's in Michael Hurgeon's architecture book where he thought exactly of these very depth green. Of course, and he filed for a patent for it in 1916 and had the audacity to die before he could ever do anything with it. And it just kind of stayed buried. But it, the whole point is that I pet, tell people is we don't have a monopoly on on new ideas. We just got technology, and we got to use our do our best to carry it forward. I mean, that, and that's all we're doing here. And so, when we were able to prove this at Michigan State that these very depth greens worked, good for us. And but I have a feeling F. W. Taylor was just smiling down there, nodding and said, "Good job, good job." Right. So, if, if you take and I use Augusta again as an example because it's probably the most widely known. I, I sure. as we talked in the pre, I, I knew Michigan State's course, but that was a course from uh, forty years ago. Oh, it's not, not quite the same <laughs> as back then. But we'll, we'll use because and fourteen at Augusta because it has the false front, right. and then then it has the uh, the front half, and then it has the second half that kind of goes up that ridge. So what you're what I'm hearing you say it, the, the I'm sure Augusta obviously has a variable depth green. They have the latest. No, nope, they don't. Have no, them. they don't. Not yet. They might. They might when they rebuild, but they don't hmm. have them right now. Okay, so that was going to be my question: is if you took a green like 14, the front is going to have certain depth to the false front, then the middle is going front to have another have depth. 16 to 20 inches of root zone, and then back on the humps where the water I'd want want it to stay a little wetter. You know, and I don't get too worried about the humps. Why? Because that's what they what they do is they dry out. Humps dry out. And by the way, I never put a hole location on a hump. No. A ball doesn't even stay on a hump. <laughs> the only thing I gotta do from an aesthetic standpoint is get a hose back there and water that hump so it doesn't dry out and look hell and look like hell. So when you come by and say, even though your ball's never there, you come by and say, Well, why does that look bad? 
So I'm wasting a lot of resources by having somebody drag a hose on an area that never even gets played on. <laughs> so this is, you'd be, it's been, it's been wonderful to implement some of these because people will say, boy, this has really made a difference. Best compliment I ever got was from a spouse of a superintendent. They said, thanks for my spouse back on the weekends. Really? That's, no, that, 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 that's pretty impactful. Yeah, that's impactful right there. The, um, as we're talking about greens and, and firmness uh, along those lines, uh, can, can you explain how trueness of a green and the speed of a green differ? Well, when you think, when you think about trueness, for me, I, you know, I, I think about the fact when the ball get hit, it stays on that line. Okay, so that means it's not being knocked off line by, you know, it could be knocked off line by a grain of sand. It could be knocked off line by a spike mark, but we don't have those anymore. But that's that's what you talk about when you say trueness, the ball holds its line. Mm -hmm. Speed, of course, is all based on friction, period. Less friction, more speed, right? Fastest greens you ever play on are always those greens in uh, – Late February down in Florida, or even probably down in South Georgia before when the if, that haven't been overseeded. Oh, God. Yeah, that is completely lightning dormant. Lightning fast. Lightning fast because there's no friction, right? And almost, to, you know, so that's the difference for me is in, in trueness and speed. And, and you can get, how, how would you get one versus the other? Because if one's, it seems like they run. Congruent, but they also are are separate of one another. As you just well, they do run, they do run pair, they do run fine. But you know, you can, you know, one of the things, for example, uh, when you have a really slow green, if I get it real fast, I can't play. If I get above the hole, I can't play it at all. So I can have a fairly slow green from a standpoint. If you want to use a step meter of ten as slow, used to be lightning fast when I first started, but. Um, but at the same time, I have to have 10 because of the slope to those greens. Otherwise, I, it'd be a five and a half hour round for everybody that played it. Right. But it doesn't mean that I can't be true. Okay. So I will have had, you know, my mowing would have been good. My verticutting would have been good. So that I would be having the plants at a density that would provide that trueness. So that goes back to your the, the frequency of cutting that the plant is growing. Let's. I'll just, and, as a rude, crude term, I'll say the plant is growing horizontally, so there's more density, and that uh, it, it can be slower, but it can be smooth. That plays a role, and also another management practice called vertical mowing or vertical cutting, where you're kind of trying to thin it out a little bit so that you get a also a trueness as well. Would brushing be part of that as well? Brushing can be a part of that, right? You know, we didn't have. Brushing was something that if you had looked at a mower prior to 1972, you wouldn't have seen, you you would have not mowed without a brush. And then brushing went away and then it kind of returned again, probably around 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, as people kind of reintroduced brushing. So it's in the same vein. Hmm. It's gone for a while. It's very interesting that, that yeah, you, if, if you have the fundamental good practices of your mowing and and you can keep things consistent. You can grow them maybe longer, depending on the architecture of your golf course. Uh, you can speed them up, but it, it, it's going to depend on the the slope. I think it was a four degree slope is about the maximum you have in a green or should have. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to, yeah, for having any kind of uh, playability, I mean, you know, because if you had a, and one of the things you were talking about, Augusta, Augusta's done a pretty good job of, slightly modifying their slopes without anybody knowing about it, right? <laughs> they're real good at that. Right? And everybody says it's the same green, now, and you'll find out, nah, they moved it a degree or two. Whereas if we go to, let's go back to green, you were, of course, you were mentioning Crystal Downs, where I know they haven't done anything to those greens in the sense they were built now almost 100 years ago. And so they are difficult to play sometimes. You can hit shots there and, and that were great shots and then watch the ball roll all the way down to the bottom of the fairway and just go, and nothing you can do. There's nothing you can Throw do. your hands up. That's, that's right. the way it and, is. And yet if Alistair McKenzie walked right on the golf course, you know, first thing he'd say would be, oh, we got to change that. Because that's not what I intended. I intended that green to be, have a stint meter 
They didn't even know what a stem meter was back then, but I, he would have been thinking that thing rolled seven, not 11. So that is what the renovation era has been all about in the last 10, 12 years here in the United States. Anytime you go to a golf course and they say we're renovating, particularly if they've got their old native soil greens, and they love, you know, because we have GPS, because we have, we can laser these greens, we can get them back to almost, but we can get them back to where the average golfer says it's the same green, but they've been tilted maybe a half a degree or a degree to where the ball will stay now on the green. And all of a sudden we got the same green because we can build it back because of the, of the technology that we have. Mm -hmm. And so it's been wonderful. and. It's been something that's really, uh, you know, since we got this technology, first time I ever saw it was, based, of course, from Augusta, from a thing I'd seen in Augusta. But, you know, and then from there, it kind of branches out. And they all use it now, right? I mean, it doesn't matter. You move up and down the East Coast, you got Marion, all of them. They've all readjusted their greens to be more 21st century greens. But the members look at them and say, what'd you do? I thought you were, you know, it's the same green. And it's really not. And so that's the beauty of it, right? Yeah. And the best architects, the best architect are the ones that can do that. You know, those are the guys that can that can say, that can pull that off and have somebody say, it looks the same. Perfect. Yeah, it uh, it, it's come quite a way since H.A. Templeton wrote his book, The, the Art, was it the Science and Art of Putting and, and Greens, where he would take sticks with red string to, to figure out the slope differences where he would uh, graph off all the greens at, at his course or wherever else he was to, to, to do the calculations on the, the based off the slope and the break. So it, it's l l little uh, improvement since he wrote that book. I don't know how many. Oh, yeah. Ago. Yeah. Thank God. But, um, but the only thing that's improved is the technology, not the idea. Yeah. Like you said, it, it's uh, the ideas were there. They just didn't have didn't know how to go about formulating the implementation. Or they didn't have plastic, or they didn't have a cell phone, or they, you know, satellites. What, yeah, the technology. Well, the, the the other big one that a lot of people talk about, and you see them argue or disagreements and and fallacy, and uh, well, what's the word today? Disinformation. We'll, we'll use that one. Is grain. And, uh, you know, you've got different courses and, and grasses around the country. You've got Bermuda down here in the south. you got the bluegrass and rye up in, in the Midwest, northeast, I think. And then the POA, a lot of it out west. And even, I think, you have, I think Oakland Hills has a lot of POA. There's lots of annual bluegrass in Michigan and New York and, and, and Long Island and, and uh, you know, Wingfoot. They redid their greens in 2020 for the U.S. Open, and they, they cut the annual bluegrass, which is POA. Uh, you yeah, cut the annual bluegrass off, set it under the shade, built the green, put the annual bluegrass right back on. Uh, it's not, there are some people that think this is an absolutely superior putting surface and they're not going to change this at all. Mm -hmm. And there's others that say, we'll use the bent grass, the new bent grasses, and, and when we renovate, we'll use this because we feel like we can get the putting speed. We feel like we can use less water, use less, we use less chemicals. So we're going to go that direction. So it's really, you know, what somebody becomes comfortable with. I don't, I don't get hung up on, you know, which way they go. I will say that, you know, when somebody starts talking about grain, I can, yes, I will see grain in warm season grasses. I don't see a lot of grain in cool season grasses. And, and I also see where a, putting green that's well groomed it's where that superintendent is working hard to make that trueness as you've said as you have said the grain is difficult it's difficult to find grain at that point that's what the superintendent is trying to do is to keep that grain from being there now sometimes it's hard just because you get a a slope off of a green where a hundred percent of the water flows off of that can get grainy pretty quick Mm -hmm. On warm season grasses, not so much on cool season. It is is the argument go? You know, Johnny Miller used to talk about that the grains growing towards the setting sun, and then you've got some people say it, it grows towards the water. Yeah, uh, there, if there's a pond like uh, the old, and I, I haven't or played the low spot. Yeah, or the low spot. Grains off. Like right. uh, was it um, 
16 was it 16 at oakland hills before they did the where the pond was in front of the green yeah. everyone would say yeah. the green but as you mentioned in warm weather grasses uh, but it, it is there a direction or something that influences influences direction more than others I, I i think it's the slope i think it's going toward the water i think it's the the way the water moves off the surface that would influence that more than anything and is that why grain would appear to grow downhill more often than yeah. not yeah, because that's the way water is moving, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Johnny Miller, he's uh, yeah, he, he's <laughs> super dense, would go crazy, and every every Monday morning when we'd have class, the students would be just you know furious with what they saw or what they heard. And I remember one year Johnny Miller spoke at the Golf Course Superintendents Association. He was the keynote speaker, and uh, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, really? Johnny Miller's going to walk into a room of a thousand superintendents. I was like, this guy is, he's, he is great. He's cool. Mm. Right. And so he goes in there and, and uh, he charms them to death. Or well, he kind of works around his grain thing and kind of says, you know, I understand what you guys are saying. I'm just trying to get to the audience. And so, you know, he got into the questions finally and he, somebody asked him about, you know, his game and golf and, he was telling them a story, and he said, you know, I, I, I was getting ready to go play, and I had a wood club, and that was I just put in my bag. He said, you know the wood club. I just got it yesterday. Wood works only one day. And so <laughs> and I, he, got, he, he charmed that audience. He, it was like he had a thousand snakes, and he, they just. Wow, that's, that's pretty cool. That, especially <laughs> for him, that had to be like walking into it. Den of snakes. Uh, yeah, I, I said, man, you are, you got some stones. And even in the warm weather grasses, in particular, uh, it's more. I think more so. Not just going to show my ignorance. More so in the southeast with the Bermuda grasses. That once you get to a certain mo height, that the grain is basically a non-factor. Yeah, and I think, and of course now, now with these, uh, you know, with the new bent grass, our, our Bermuda grasses, the hybrids like Tiff Eagle and. And many verde and, and and those that can be mowed much much lower, we don't see it as much, right? And 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 the cultural practices like the vertical mowing and the and the organic matter management that these people know they have to do in order to maintain firmness. Again, we don't see it as much. So what you really come upon, you know, it's all technology and the science, the science that we have learned from this. Mm -hmm. What you had mentioned. Um managing uh, organic matter uh, how, how do you it, go, go about doing that or f first can you explain it to people who might not know and then how you go about managing it and, and what, well, what what mismanagement of it will cause yeah so i guess the, the, you have to start off with in order to have a putting green that is considered to be firm it has to be dry now the way that it's going to be dry is it's going to be well drained and that well drain is going to come from from having a sand based green. So I've already we've already talked about the USGA green and the depth. Mm -hmm. So so that's one way. That's the starting point of keeping that dry. Now um, those sand grains, the space in between them, which is where the water drains, is called a macro pore space or pore space. Why I call it macro pores and when when the plant starts to naturally break down as that roots slough off and they break down they become those particles of the roots become smaller and smaller and smaller as they break down through microbial activity to where they begin very small almost micro sized almost the size of clay particles and they become organic okay so that's why in a brand new green, I have no organic matter. Come back a year later, I got 1% organic matter in the top inch. Come back two years later, this is if I've done nothing. Come back two years later, I'll have 3% organic matter. And three years later, I've got a disaster hmm. because I haven't managed my organic matter. So if you are that superintendent, you are managing organic matter, not a whole lot different than I would be sweeping the floor. Okay, I'm sweeping my floor to keep my dirt off my floor. I've got a, I've got two doors that are constantly open and 
dust is coming in and I've got to keep this sweat. You say, well, and I, and why is it so important? Because, I, you know, I, that organic matter begins to fill those voids. And now all of a sudden that water doesn't drain very fast. And if the water doesn't drain very fast, it, st- it sits up there in that inch or two, stays wet, stays wet. And that's the problem that we have. So we have spent lots of money, lots of time, lots of research in how to manage this organic matter. I, we could talk for hours, but it, and it would bore the hell out of most people. But the, the, but the fact of the matter is, is that it's a 21st century problem. If I go back prior to the 20, to, to 2000, I won't find any real work on organic matter done by any any research hmm. and we didn't have the tools to manage the organic matter we didn't have we didn't understand how sand top dressing worked with organic matter even today i'll i'll read articles from people that are, that are you know it's reminding me all the time of how relatively new the understanding the role of organic matter plays and how we have to manage that organic matter and certain grasses will produce more organic matter. It's a great fallacy that, you know, Bermuda grass A produces more organic matter than Bermuda grass B. That's probably not true. It probably is true that Bermuda grass produces more organic matter than annual bluegrass. It probably is true that creeping bent grass produces more organic matter than annual bluegrass. Okay? So I have to manage them differently. And the way I manage them all gets managed. It's all based on you know, how many months of, of a year am I playing? I'm playing 12 months a year on, on bent grass in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm only playing six months a year in Rochester, New York. So all of these things play a role into how I have to manage my organic matter, manage my turf. And some people, it's superintendents, extremely exciting. To probably half the audience is listening right now, they say, "Can you move on to another subject?" But, uh, <laughs> no, it's very yeah. interesting that the the, the the difference. What what would be the difference between organic matter and thatch to build up on a green? Or, or is there one? Thatch is on top. Okay, so the organic matter the organic gets matter brought down in into the, the and more the into the organic matter in the soil. Okay, right. The thatch is on top. I I I'm not going to get down to the thatch. Once I get through the thatch, then I'm at the soil. Then I'm going to get into the organic matter that's in between those soil particles. And, and what is the practice to, to eliminate or maintain uh, the organic matter as it gets into the soil? Well, the one that you know every damn well, every one of you hate the most is punching holes, right? Because I've got to remove organic matter. And... Uh, you know, from there, we could go into a dissertation of all the different things. And so, you know, all the things that we've looked at is how to have a smaller hole so it'll heal faster, tighter spacing, maybe a, maybe a sh- more shallow hole so we get the sand in, dry our sand in the kiln so it'll work its way down into the profile easier because it doesn't have any friction. Tie thing after thing after thing, you know. So you really get into that chasing perfection Mm -hmm. that uh and that's really what if you've ever thought about it that's what that's why superintendents do what they do they like to chase perfection golf course is a place where perfectionists can toil and never get bored yeah because it's almost like you can never achieve it it's constant because it's constantly changing Uh constantly changing you got weather patterns as you said you got different grasses like the game of golf itself Mm mm-hmm it, it, you'll it's, you'll yeah. have magic for a little while. <laughs> as soon as you think you got it, you better be ready because it's going the other way really quick. That's right. The, uh, as I was talking to Tim the other day, we were at breakfast and, or coffee, and I said, you know, I, I remember reading an article many years ago. It had to be about 12, 15 years ago, maybe longer. And it was a superintendent who had grown up in, in, a, in an area uh, close, maybe close to Arkansas, where you're, maybe he was in Oklahoma. He was, out, he was that part of the country. And he had grown up there, and I think he tried playing the pro tour and, and didn't make it. Uh, went home, ended up becoming the superintendent of this golf course. Even if you said it, I wouldn't remember. It was a long time ago yep. that I read this. But yeah. he, he became very well known for the maintenance of the golf course. And when he was visited by some, I think the USGA, some of the officials went, 
not Tim, but some at that time. And and one of the, the key features of the articles was that he didn't airify. So I would have to imagine in, in talking to you about different things in different parts of the country that it would depend on the greens, the way they were built, and his other maintenance practices that he would or wouldn't have to. Because it seemed for a while there was an argument between superintendents that airifying is good, and the other one said, no, that, no it's not. And there was this uh, debate or uh they weren't not not disrespectful anyway, but some of the industry say you need to, and some said no, no you don't. And I get it, and 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 you can get away with the, the, and it boils down to Pete. It boils down to, and we've learned this. We learned this a long time ago. I can get away without airifying the if a golf course green is constructed a certain way. If a golf course green is constructed like a USGA green. I would argue it's almost impossible to get away from airifying just because of the way the water, you know, the, the green is built so that you're not constantly having the water. Okay, it's got a gravel layer that kind of helps to hold the water in. So the other types of greens that are built are ones that don't have that gravel layer but might have a drain set of drains called it's called a California green. Now that kind of green you can get away with in theory. No. Um, you know, no cultivation. And I, you know, here at Michigan State, I watched um, Kurt Thummel, longtime superintendent at Walnut Hills, which was only a couple of miles north mm -hmm. of Forest Acres where he played. From 1981 to 2015, he did never co cultivate his greens. Had some of the best greens ever. Now, what did he do? I used to tell people here's the thing. First of all, he didn't have a USGA green, so this is one of the reasons why he could get away with it. Second of all, he's the first guy to top dress, and he's the only guy that's ever top dressed. So he, so anything that had been done, he knew exactly what he had put on that green. The third thing was he was anal to a point of almost difficult to work for because every two weeks we burned a cut. I mean, every week we burned a cut. Every week we brushed, and every two weeks we sand top dressed. And he didn't care what the excuse was. We were doing it. So, and that's all about maintenance, right? And if you think about it, you know, it's not a whole lot different than the guy who says, I got to go run today. And if I don't go run today, I'm going to punch somebody. Yeah, you're going to be miserable. And so, but in his mind, this was his way that he kept up with the organic, managing the organic matter. And then, because what he was doing, instead of removing the organic matter with the punching of the holes, he was diluting the organic. And again, you could get away with that, not to get to too deep into this, but it was because of the fact that of the construction type of the grain. Mm -hmm. And did he know that? Or did, uh, or did he, he just did. figure it out a way that, that he didn't? Or he, he, and I had that, person? he and I had that conversation um a lot of times, I know that he was probably about three years into it in 1985. And this was a couple years before I got there when he said, why can't I do it this way? And he went to talk to one of our soul professors named Dr. Paul Rieke, who's still alive. And Dr. Rieke said, you know, and, and again, again, you got to remember now, it's 1985. So in 1985, the idea of sand top dressing on a frequent basis was only about four years old. Hmm. Okay, so this is, when I talk about these things being 21st century problems, <laughs> that, that it, we're not things we've been doing for 100 years. Because back in 1985, in, in that time, we didn't have the top dressers we do now. If you wanted to put top dressing out on a real, on a thin sheet like they do, good luck. Yeah, to do it by hand, didn't you? Yeah, good luck. We didn't have a machine for it. Mm -hmm. We hadn't asked that. The superintendent hadn't asked that company and said, here's my problem. What can you build? They had said, well, I got an old manure spreader. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to work. But if you flipped it around, yeah, the guy said, if I flip it around and I put a different uh, bell on here and another whistle, it might work. Why? Right. And herein, this is how every piece of equipment has been developed by need. That's that's very interesting. Very cool, actually. Uh, I uh, when I got when I was a senior in high school that summer, I worked at a golf course, and the back nine was new. They had just built it, and the 
uh, the the uh, what hole was it? I think it was a seventeen sixteen fifteenth hole is a par five, and and over half the fairway, five hundred some yard par five, and I would say three hundred fifty yards of it didn't grow in. So we had to uh, lay the seed, and which was the easy part, and I didn't know the hard part was coming. But then they they drove the dump truck out, and they said we got to we got to throw dirt over this. And I said why? They said because you don't. Seed doesn't grow on top of dirt; it grows under. I said, "Okay." Yeah, well, we, we, we I, just said, saw I said, yeah. "Who's going to spread the dirt to over top of the seed?" And they said, "You guys are." <laughs> so they brought a dump truck out, and they would slowly jump off some some dirt piles. And guess who had to go shovel it and throw it by hand over the? That's right. It was that was not fun. Uh, yeah, that that tech or that uh... that was technology in the late eighties for us or for yeah. me. And, you know, the science behind it hadn't changed. It's just now we've got ourselves a top dresser where you can put that seed out and I'll drive that top dresser over the top of it and lay out about an eighth of an inch. And man versus machine, machine wins. There's one of the private courses here that in the summer, a lot of the members in the summer will go into the mountains because we get, we get pretty hot around here, you know, on the coast, of the southern point of South Carolina. So they'll, they'll go up to uh, Boone, Asheville, Greenville. Uh, further, some go up to Vermont and Maine. But uh, what the superintendent would do in the summertime was, I think it was every Tuesday uh, afternoon, he, he would top dress every green mm -hmm. every week. And then come mm -hmm. the fall, uh, early October, mid-October was when they would have a member guest. And those greens would be like glass. They were unbelievable. Sure. And he was the only one yeah. around here that would do that. He, he had the ability. Most of the other courses had full full year play, but he had that ability to do it. And it was unbelievably right. different. Right. Yeah, you know, um, the old old saying is golf course be easy to maintain for one for the golfers. The um, Bermuda seems to be creeping further and further north. Is is that an effect of changes in climate, or is that an effect of grasses becoming uh, adaptable to to colder temperatures? What what, what is the, the cause of that? Well, first of all, we definitely have grasses. We have the the breeding efforts by these geneticists have been for more cold tolerance in Bermuda grass, without question, all right? So to provide a solution for a place like Northern Tennessee, uh, Southern Kentucky, Missouri, play, or, uh, St. Louis, things of this nature, right? So no question there, no question. And we've got some really good ones right now, Tahoma 31, Northbridge, go on and on. Um, so that is for sure done that now as you might suspect just the general nature of somebody is why can't i push it a little further north why can't i push it a little further north let me see what i can do let me see you know you can make you can turn around and do the same thing with bent grass by the way make it more heat tolerant more heat tolerant and that's why they've moved it south right huh. they've done the same thing with that you know and uh Augusta is not a great example because Augusta closes during the summertime. But you know, they you know Atlanta was a good time where they you know they moved bent grass to south. But Pete, I can remember a a period of time in the mid seventies, and again, this is where the old idea of <laughs> no no ideas and new ones. Hatchy Golf Club said Down we in uh, South Florida bent grass year round. Yep. in Florida and that's in the 70s so it doesn't never stops people from thinking that people are always saying let me push 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 I want to push for perfection you know and I think we saw the difference in Augusta uh, the way it plays in the spring when it's traditionally held in the the COVID year when they moved it to October because it yeah, was that's, that's a good point that that you all everybody got to see uh just how soft that golf course was mm -hmm. and uh you know give credit to augusta because they let everybody see it they didn't have to and and uh i think they've you know they're they're still our bellwether no matter what anybody ever says you know i, I love it when somebody says i got the augusta syndrome but i always say do you realize how much augusta's done for the golf course mm -hmm. industry how much it trickles down to all of us, you know, and yeah, yeah, okay, well, we get a little pressure every once in a while, but but some of the techniques and some of the technology 
that a guest has asked for, and then eventually gets its way, builds its way into the industry. You can almost, uh, don't get this the wrong way, you could almost take it almost like the United States Army. You know, some of the things that the U.S. Are Army tested, gets, yeah. It always tested the Army first. It goes through them because they've got the money, right? Mm -hmm. the, They're never going to say, well, that's going to be too expensive for us to <laughs> test out. They're not going to say that. A, a, a lot of management practices, uh, I've talked to a number of friends who were in the Army and military, were, were first implemented in, in the military to see how they would uh, work and then it, how they need to modify and then they slowly shifted it, moved it into the private sector. Sure. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not unusual, right? I mean, you know, that, that that's where you can test and and if you have a failure, you say, well, it was a half a million dollar failure. I don't think it's going to bankrupt the federal government, <laughs> but, it might, but it might bankrupt a startup company, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, you know, I, that's why I'm always like, go, Augusta, go, go. A new idea, go. There's two places in the world that I, that I think lead this. And the other one, you may not think about much, but it's the other place in the world where I think is hallowed ground for turf grass. And that's Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. You go underneath the ground at Wimbledon, you will find some of the technology that is just phenomenal. They are 10 years out with projects that they are planning right now. Same with Augusta. You know, they, okay. they've got these plans for things, but they have the infrastructure, they have the money, they know they're going to, you know, they know they're going to be in front of the world every year at the same time. So, there's two 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 hollow pieces of ground. Another example would be uh, uh, not so much turf, but Churchill Downs, right, where they run the derby every year. They would go there. You can see the infrastructure there is out of this world. The the uh, when I, I had the one question I had in the back of my mind was Augusta, when, and and I live a little over two hours from there, so I think 150 miles, I think, maybe a little less, almost three, two and a half hours. The the way it played usually plays in the spring versus how it did in, in the fall that year in October, I think when Dustin Johnson won. But was was that the the was it so wet due to the amount of overseed that they put down? Not so much or, the overseed, but the weather, the the rain that they'd had, right? And 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 the fact that, you know, you got if you think about a November didn't they play it in November, wasn't I right? Yeah, it was, it was somewhere late October, early November. I can't remember exactly I thought it was, when. I thought it, it was it, like it could be, it could be November right. ten or eleven. Now you know, that's kind of like if you play, that's today, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not trying to ruin your podcast, but it's today it is November the 6th. So how many hours of day length do we have? And the fact that we are only about 50 days from the shortest day of the year. Now, if you go 50 days after December 22nd, that's what? That's about February 10th. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't see Augusta for two more months after that. That's 60 more days of increasing daily. That's 60 more days of being able to dry things out. So that time of year in November, it is just very, very difficult to dry things out because of the length of the day. Interesting. Very so, interesting. Again, I, yeah, hats off to them being able to pull it off, right? I mean, they're, they're that, that is a complete flip from what they're used to, and more importantly, what everybody else is used to seeing. Wow, I, I never thought of it that way. You're, but you're absolutely correct. That, that that's why you're the expert, and I'm just asking the question. <laughs> that's just the way my brain works. So, has um, is, is the not to get into political part of it, but it, the client, the changes in climate as it's happening, and and uh, and I get you know I, we talked in the pre-show. I, you know, I grew up just north of Detroit, but I can distinctly remember back then four seasons where you could almost circle the date on your calendar. You knew it was going to be spring by. Uh, the third week of April, you know, and, and after that, you knew the weather was going to gradually get better until you got to June and it was warm. And then in the fall, usually by the third, fourth week of September, you knew it was going to start to cool down and you worked in Halloween and this time of year. And then you know, you had an idea when it was going to snow and everything. But it seems like nowadays that, <laughs> you know, my dad will call me from Michigan and say it's in January. It's 58 degrees. He can't believe it. So it's 65 how, here today. Yeah. Right? How, how do you man do you manage that when you're working with brasses on a golf course or a field or uh, no, it's not so bad on, on up up in here i mean because we don't worry about with cool season grasses they don't 
get too concerned about losing to winter kill. We don't get too concerned about cool season grasses. If we're going to lose a cool season grass to winter kill, it's usually because it's in a poorly drained area. And gets back to that water issue yeah. again. So, you know, and, and then if it's in a poorly drained area, you could also turn around and say, that's your fault. Mm-hmm. You didn't take care of that. That was a problem that you had, as opposed to Mother Nature brought this huge hurricane on us, right? That's not our fault. No, nothing. So, act of nature, oh, act of God. Right. So, and so um, with cool season grasses, it's not as big a thing. Now, interestingly, with warm season grasses, it can be. It can be. And that's one of the things you always worry about pushing warm season grasses north is can you have a situation where you lose this grass? And usually when you lose a warm season grass, this is the interesting way it happens. It happens, it doesn't happen during the coldest part of the year in January. It happens at the beginning or the end of the warm up or the cool down period. Yeah, the transition. Yeah. And and the the way the way you describe it to somebody is the grass if the grass is actively growing in November, it has no idea from a standpoint that it's getting ready to go from eighty degrees to zero. Okay? It has no idea this blue northerner, as I grew up in Arkansas, was, was they, they would call it, was about to push through and change its temperature so very, very rapidly. Because when it does change that temperature, because because what it, if if it if it goes down gradually, the plant has a chance. And if I change it from eighty to seventy to sixty to fifty to forty, over a two, three, four, five, seven, ten, twelve, fifteen day period, the the amount of water that's in that plant or in the cell of each one of these plants shifts, and it goes from a hundred percent or about ninety percent water down to fifty percent water. Hmm. Now, the importance of that is. It's very simple. I'm going to take a Coke bottle, a bottle of Coke, and I'm going to put it in your freezer, and it's going to be full. I'm going to pop it open, and then it's going to be full. And you're going to come back two days or a day later, and you're going to be cleaning Coke out of your freezer, mm-hmm. right? Yep. But if I can pour half of that out and do the same thing, it just kind of expands. Well, that's the turf grass plant, too. Interesting. And so if it's put into that situation, it will literally just explode. So when will that likely happen? Not in January, where we've kind of already gotten cooled off, but in that period where it's been 80, 80, 80, 80, now it's zero. It doesn't happen all the time. And it can happen in the fall. It can also happen in the spring. When the plant thinks it's time to grow, then all of a sudden we hit a cold snap. And that, when did, I'm thinking 2019, that happened in, down in the southeast, and, and, and particularly in, in, through Arkansas and Oklahoma. And when, when something like that happens, you know, we, we get a lot of dead grass, and then that puts a big run on sod farms. Yep. You know, we run out of sod, and everybody's sad, and a superintendent, you know, it just makes for a miserable time. Around here, it, it, it's the going from the cooler season to the warm season. It's usually that May, mostly in May and then into early June crossover. Is that uh, the, if if we if it doesn't cool or warm up gradually, as you said up there, if it, if it cools too quickly, but here is it warming up and that that uh, soil temperature doesn't get high enough for that Bermuda grass to kick on, and it gets too warm too quick, it kills out that winter grass, and then the the Bermuda hasn't had a yeah. chance to activate yet, and, it, and it's just barren in the courses around here because that's part. So we're still in busy season then. Yeah, that's a different story. That's yes. different, you know, that's a totally different story. But yes, exactly. That's a, that's another issue, of course. Right. Are are, are you a fan of overseeding in, in in places in in the southeast in particular, or oh, even yeah, in the Pacific okay. Southwest? A lot of people overseed, and a lot of people, you know, they they have to overseed in order to keep the clientele happy. Mm-hmm keep it up i have so what have i watched i've watched overseeding rates probably be cut by you know about 400 percent because people have realized i don't need that much seed i don't need that much seed it makes i can and part of it is because 30 years ago i didn't really have a chemical 
that I could take that seat out when it was time. Now I do. Now I do. You know, um, so but back back 30 years ago, I used to have to take that ryegrass out by turning off the water, hoping it got hot, letting mm -hmm. it die, and hoping I had enough Bermuda grass underneath there. Well, now, of course, I can take, I've got chemicals that have been designed to not touch the Bermuda grass, but to take out the perennial ryegrass, the overseeded grass. And then all of a sudden, all I got to do is time it to where I take that out and then let the Bermuda start growing up underneath it. And you know, we didn't have that back then. And what was interesting, what was not to get too far down in the weeds, but I can already tell you don't mind. The, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the thing was with, with a lot of these ryegrasses that these superintendents were running into is that the breeding efforts that were done by the majority of these guys were to try to get per perennial ryegrasses to have more heat tolerance in places like Indianapolis, in places like Washington, D.C., because people mm -hmm. were still wanting to use perennial ryegrass. Well, that same heat tolerance was being transferred down to South Carolina and northern and southern Georgia and North Florida. And so all of a sudden, it'd be 92 degrees outside. The Bermuda would be wanting to grow, and the ryegrass would be looking at you going, I'm doing fine. I'm loving it. <laughs> now you got a big problem. Now heard... you got a big problem. Yeah. And so, up there, so, you know, again, down in the weeds, but it's still... You know, it's still so a good superintendent was always looking for give me a ryegrass that had crappy heat tolerance because I want to get rid of it when it's time to get rid of it. I can what? make it look good for three months, four months, five months. I don't need to have it make it look good for twelve months, and I want to be able to get rid of it in May. How, uh, how do you get a, um, or deal with the uh, depletion of nutritional efficiency when you're taxing the soil? More so, like you know, the soil usually has it around in the southeast. I'm only speaking that because that's where I live and know it the best. Um, you know, it goes dormant, and then usually in the dormant season, it gets some organic matter it might use to replenish itself throughout the, the season, but it goes dormant for a reason. And you start throwing other grasses on it, they're going to take nutrients out of the soil. Now you're you got too much. So, I'm still, how, how did... that, I'm still fertilizing that cool season grass during that okay. time. Okay, so I'm 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 supplementing that with my with with synthetic or organic fertilizers over the winter time because the Bermuda grass is dormant; it's not taking it up. The only grass that's taking it up is the grass that's actively growing. See, a, a dormant grass can't take up anything. I've got a grass that's brown and dormant, and I sprayed Roundup on it; it wouldn't die mm -hmm. because it can't absorb it. That's one of the reasons why, you know, when with that's one of the reasons why weed control, you should look on the back of the label and it gives you a, here is the window in which you want to apply this because you want to apply it when the weed will take it up and die. But uh, so the the it, it, where you get into problem like the course I'm at now, they're thirty three years old, I think, right around there, thir thirty plus. And they, they had an issue. They lost the greens in, in the transition this year. They didn't come back for half the summer. They had six temporary greens. And they had some either from NC State or Rutgers came in. They brought them in. And they did the soil testing, and they came back and said, your soil is depleted. You, you basically shot your soil. And the assumption was that because they do such a heavy overseed that they had depleted over time the nutrients in the soil. So is that just a practice of mismanagement of fertilizing or that the soil just gets a, That's difficult for me to say, and I wouldn't speculate on that because okay. not being, you know, not being a part of that. Um, but you know, there's, there's, and there's lots of things that can cause a Bermuda grass to thin out. It could be shade, mm -hmm. you know, from trees. There's, there's, and it can be, you know, heavy overseedings, and so that that grass gets difficult, difficult for it to come back. But, and it can be, it can also be the winter kill that we just discussed. You know, so there's. You know, it could have died way before we even covered it up with ryegrass. Yeah, because you know, for for years I've heard around here the argument for one is don't deplete your soil. But I'm thinking to myself, well, if you're fertilizing it and you're giving it what it needs, food it needs, basically, yeah. how is how are you going to deplete your soil? So yeah, that, that, that was a question I always had that I never. Yeah, knew. that's a difficult one for me to understand and answer. Um, how has um. I want to move a little bit into, into, into sports fields because you, you've played an instrumental role in that. And I, I went to the 94 World Cup with the Silver Dome. I was, Is that right? Yeah, I, I was still, I was, go, I, I went to Ferris State 
uh, their golf program. And I, as I, mm-hmm. you know, the Silver Dome. I grew up in Utica, so it was 15 minutes up, up the highway. And uh, I, even going back then, you're answering a lot of questions that have been in the back of my head for a long time. So you're you're clearing out some of the cobwebs that maybe I'll be working a little better, my brain going forward. <laughs> but um, I always wondered how you were able to grow grass at the level required for a World Cup indoors. Uh, it, back then, well, in particular. Well, I mean. So we didn't take the tack that we were going to grow it. We were taking the tack that we were going to put it in. We were going to put it in there at the optimum level that it could be at its, its absolute peak, and then have it thrive or have it survive for that four week period. Because mm-hmm. one thing we knew is that the World Cup's going to have an end date. Same thing with this twenty six World Cup. When when everything that we're planning is, you know, we're not. We have a start and an end date, and when the end date's there. Nobody cares anymore. <laughs> Nobody cares. Just, just, just make sure it looks good till the end of the thing. And so, um, you know, so for the silver dome, we just we we did what's called a modular turf, and that we planted it in hexagon shaped trays, and says that we moved a plant in. People think we moved inside. We didn't move inside. We moved in pots of of grass. So six inches of soil plus the grass. And we moved them in, we shoved them together, made a nice tight field so that the players couldn't, they had no idea what they were playing on a modular field. They thought they were just playing on turf. And it worked out well. And, and that's kind of what we've done, what we did for 20 years, 25 years, all the way through the 2008 Olympics in China. And when people would ask us, and now that this 26 World Cup is coming along, um, we're going to use some different technology, but we're not going to change our ideas. So we're going to bring a plant in there that's very robust. Now we're going to have grow lights that we didn't have back in 94. So we're going to be able to have those in there. But the whole idea is there is that this is what we're calling a temporary, not a permanent field. So. It'll be interesting. You you watch this and you come back. We'll do something between now and then, and and you'll see some of this, how this happens. And 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 I feel very strongly that some of this technology that FIFA has paid for, research wise, that will actually trickle its way into golf as well. So it'll be pretty fun to watch. How how, how so? And what what would trickle over into golf? Temporary, temporary fields, temporary fields. So if I can put a, if I can build a temporary athletic field i can build a temporary tee wow. so like i'm working on a project right now down in florida and i'm trying to talk at superintendent and i think he's buying it is that you know because half of his tees are you know because as you know in florida when do they play they play october through what may mm-hmm. and then may through october it's just a bear down there from not so much from the standpoint of the heat but the rain so this golf course is kind of in the Mayaka River area. So if it's in that river area, a lot of these tees actually are under, they talk about them being potentially underwater where the architect wants the back tee to be. Not underwater in May, not underwater in March, but underwater in, in the July summer. and August. Yeah, they get those 3.30 or 4 o'clock rains for yeah, so 20, 30 minutes. It comes up and it floods. and so, But not in February, not in March, and that's fine. So it's like, well. Why don't we build temporary tees back there, so that when when we get into when we get into June or July through October, there's not a tee back there for us to worry about. It's just an asphalt pad. <laughs> It'll so bring the temporary tee in. So it's like putting a, uh, pieces of puzzle all together. Bingo. That's pretty interesting. I was, and the one I was thinking of would be for a driving tee box uh, at a very Absolutely. very busy place. Absolutely. But. Um, and this, I'm just giving you another example of things that I've been thinking about. So, and that's in high traffic areas because you know you mentioned Wimbledon, uh, and, and the the baseline obviously gets a lot of wear and tear. And on right. you, you you watch football on TV, and the, the middle of the field will get a lot of wear and tear. It, it is the same concept? Would 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 it be used there? Well, it already is. Okay, so when I watch when you watch an NFL game and you look in the middle of the field and it's worn out. And then the next week you come back and it's not worn out anymore. It mm-hmm. isn't because the grass grew back. It's because they resided it with big roll side. 
See, Big Roll Sod is the savior of the sports turf world. We're talking about a piece of sod that's three and a half foot wide, 60, 70 foot long, weighs 3,000 pounds. You put them next to each other, nobody's moving them. Hmm. And so that comes out on a Monday. And on a Tuesday, you're playing on it Saturday or Sunday. Nobody knows the difference. And you just watch now over the next six weeks, the number of times you look at a field and go, that just got resodded. Well, that's a big row side. Now, the golf course industry uses it too. They use it. I watched them use it for doing tees and greens and things. And just because, you know, it's become a, a much more usable tool. Um, but that's a technology that's really developed over, you know, my career. Whereas, you know, at, at the beginning back in the 90s, you'd be like, wow. Now, of course, it's, of course, that's what we're using. <laughs> the advancements. When, when you're dealing with a soccer or football field or even a tennis court where people are moving and, and stopping and, and putting uh, pressures on, right. onto the turf, how, how do you get? make sure one that it, it's sturdy enough and two that the seams aren't going to cause someone to get their foot caught twist an ankle things like that well again this 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 now goes to the size of this turf because you know we're talking about something that might be an inch and a half thick three and a half feet wide 60 feet long soil weighs 110 pounds per cubic foot if you do the math on that we got a three thousand pound mat Wow. That could only be laid out by once a very special piece of equipment. And then they push these things together with another special piece of equipment. Such that these seams are so tight. I mean, you can't even find the seam after a couple of days. So this is the technology that That's is amazing. Been, and it's been it's been kind of fun for me to introduce it to FIFA because a lot of this technology that I'm describing to you particularly growing the sod on plastic, which is what they, what we, it's only the United States does this. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. We have, we have a sod industry that is second to none in the world. Well, why is that? Is it just not in demand in other places? They don't have the golf course, they don't have the sports, they don't have the level to commitment, to return. You know, I, I, I think, I mean, you can find it in certain places every once in a while in certain countries and certain spots, but we just have the number of stadiums, the number of golf courses. Remember, half the golf courses in the world sit in the United States. Wow. Yeah, I did, that I didn't know. And I've been in golf 40 years. 30,000 golf courses in the world, 15,000 in the United States. That's not too so bad. We have an industry that is just huge compared to everybody else. Mm. Huge. I mean, it just dwarfs, absolutely dwarfs everyone else's. What What is the most unusual request that you've gotten when you're preparing a field or a course or uh, anything along those lines? Have you gotten some crazy requests? Well, um, smokes. Uh, I remember when we were doing the Spartan Stadium. Spartan Stadium went from artificial turf to natural grass. And the big thing about that stadium was uh, they needed to do some infrastructure to it. And so they weren't going to probably be able to put a field, a grass field in until maybe June and needed to play the end of August. So the athletic department came and said, well, what do you think about using, putting a portable, you know, putting this portable field in there? But it's not, I said, portable field like we're going to take it back in and out? They said, no. Only if we'd have to. I said, well, we're only playing six games a year. We're not going to have to take it in and out. So, you know, because Spartan Stadium wasn't built to have a portable field go in and out. I mean, you know, if you think about fields that are built that way, this was not. It's got a little old tunnel. And so, anyway, we put this portable field in there. So, it really, um, as the field was going in, uh, and after it got in, the president of the university did not want this white horse. I don't know if you remember that the, back when Sparty used to ride the chariot horse. Yes, around right? the perimeter. Mostly. Around the perimeter. But he only did it on artificial. If you ever thought about it, you never saw him on the natural mm -hmm. turf. And for whatever reason, the president didn't want the horse on the natural turf. So they come to me and they say, 
I want you to do some testing so we can kind of get rid of the horse on the natural turf. I said, okay, well, we got to get the graduate students together. And, and now they got to bring the horse over to the research center. And we've got <laughs> these extra modules and we can get the horse up on there. The poor horse doesn't want to be around out there. He just, he wants to go back home. But anyway, he starts running around on these modules and you're looking for him to cut the grass. And we built it too well. I mean, the damn thing's not going to cut. It's not going to cut up. We've done too good. Done and so you'd say, well, make a cut. It wouldn't cut. Make a cut. It wouldn't cut. We wet it down. It still wouldn't do it. I'm like, oh, shit. what are we going to do? So then uh, we were filming it. And all of a sudden, the horse takes a dump right on the field, right on the practice field. And I go, there's our answer. <laughs> there's our answer. Because now they've taken a dump on this natural grass. I said, we won't be able to clean it up totally. We won't be able to disinfect it because you'll kill the grass if you disinfect it. And God save a linebacker if they all of a sudden, particularly the opposing team, pummels their face in there and catches some sort of rash and dies. That's good, Dr. Rogers, they said. The horse won't get to run. And so I got to tell you, that's one of the strangest things I've ever no kidding. That one of the most natural things on the planet. Save the save the day. Yeah. Well, and it took it, it, it. You know, I had no idea how we were going to pull it off. I mean, I, I still to this day. I mean, you know, the guy could have said that's not it. that's not working. I don't know what we'd have done next. But... You, you you never know. You, know, you just do what you do, and you never know the answer that it's going to be put in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of the whole project, what we're doing right now with this World Cup project for 26. You know, new issues come up all the time. And, uh, you know, it's a big, big, big project. I mean, I it's imagine. huge. How, how many sites uh, are coming 16, this time? 16 wow. sites, three countries. Eight of the sites are artificial or be, will be temporary turf, meaning they don't have natural grass in them now. And five of those eight are domed. So we've got the and more problems. Five. Right. Well, we got a big, we got a nice team. We've been well funded uh, by FIFA. They've recognized it. This is the first time FIFA's funded research, turf grass research. So I've been very proud of FIFA for doing this. And, um, you know, the, the thing is, is that what's cool about it is they funded it. And the other thing that's cool about it is where it could trickle down mm -hmm. to the next group, right? To the next group of superintendents or the next group of field managers. Yeah, the, and, the, um, the data that you're going to get out of the experience the and what yeah, to do and not got, to do. Yeah, we'll, we'll trickle down. And, you know, you don't, to get seven-figure funding, which, you know, we this is millions of dollars of funding that FIFA has provided, both us and the University of Tennessee. We're a joint project with the University of Tennessee. I think that's an important thing to know is that because, you know, this, what we're able to do at both of these schools um, just hasn't been done. It hadn't been done. You know, the last time we had any funding to this level was the Silverdome. Mm -hmm. And we were able to push things forward pretty good but from there. And we've got even better technology now. So I feel like we'll push it even further. That's some I, pretty, pretty cool I, stuff. I think growing old. <laughs> okay, you know, Keith, I imagine it keeps you uh, interested. Uh, gets keeps you out of bed in the morning. Interested. Yeah keeps me up at night wakes me up at two in the morning a lot of times but well, uh, i guess there's a give and take you know it keeps you interesting right. but to, that's the price you got to pay for for, for yeah. having that interest level and been being that's good right. I, I you know I, I, i'm sure that some people are asking out there this well you know the golf courses look great and you know you told me how to how to um, manage the organic matter and, and football fields and soccer fields and wimbledon looks great but what, what they're probably thinking I wish he would say a couple of things to tell me I could do to make my front lawn look good. So while people are listening. The matter is I have. I have. You know, because I told you earlier on the, the thing that the homeowner does that was the worst thing they can do is mow once a week. Okay. Because that they, they're they basically scalping every time they mow. Hmm. So, you know, it's interesting. There's a couple of golf courses in the state of Michigan, one golf course in the state of Michigan, one golf course in the state of Florida that have jumped on this robotic mower. Barton Hills in Ann Arbor bought 37 robotic mowers. Jeez. And it mows every square foot of their rough. And their rough has been fantastic. Philadelphia Cricket Club has done something similar. And 
So, you know, what's interesting is, yes, the quality of the turf is great. But you know what the members, when they see that, those mowers say? I need one of those for my yard. Because they also know that if they can mow their yard that five or six times a week, they will, they too will improve the turf quality dramatically. You know, it's one thing for me to tell you to mow your yard four days a week, every other day. And you go, yay, I'm going to do that for the first week. That's <laughs> not a whole lot different than me saying, you know, we're going to quit drinking beer or we're going to run two miles every day. We're pretty good for about three days, right? Mm -hmm. And so I get it. I get what you got, you know, but at the same time, now we've got a machine that can actually do the work for us and that can provide that quality of turf that that's the the number one thing that jump starts us to having a thinner, a thicker, healthier lawn that chokes out weeds. Because it's that mowing frequency that leads to uh, the scalp turf, that leads to the light requirement that a weed needs to germinate. And then all of a sudden you say, I got a weed problem. I said, no, no, Pete, you got a mowing problem. You're not mowing enough. Mm, I'll have to do that. I mean, I, I have a townhouse, so my, I can I'll do get it. You, my, I'll get, we'll get your robotic mower. That'd be good for you. <laughs> my, my yard is about, uh, if you took the sidewalk out, it's about 25 feet wide by about 12, 15 feet deep. So I have no excuse not to mow at least three to four days a week. Well, right. And, but then that guy that's got the 12, 13, 14,000 square foot lawn, that's a different story. But mm -hmm. I got people in my neighborhood that have got these robotic mowers and, and they've got great yards. Jeez. They've got great yards. Yeah. I, I, I'll have to make myself do it. I don't, I've got it, it's sloped in my front yard. So I don't, as little as it is, I don't know if the robotic would fall onto the sidewalk and break. You'd be the surprised. These things are tough. Because, you know, there are pretty some pretty damn good slopes on these golf course roughs. If someone was used to having a certain height, but now they started mowing, it, 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 they could gradually move that mower height down to a certain level, couldn't they? Well, and, and these things have a range of height that they mow at. I mean, I've just been using one because one inch just because I, it was easy for somebody to talk about. They can mow at two and a half. They can mow at three. This mm -hmm. mower, these, these, mowing, these mowing heights can be changed quite dramatically. They're, they're and there's there's several of them on the market. They're hitting this thing with great force. Very cool. Do you, uh, you have time that we got a little emergency nine, just kind of nine fun questions to wrap up about various sure. things in golf and, and what, what things that you do and activities you participate in. So um, the, I always tell everybody that all the listeners now know it's been almost, I guess, six years. The first one and last one. Everybody, I think you're the 155th or sixth episode have gotten the first and the last one. The ones in the middle, we just kind of move around. So it's just a lot of fun to, to finish up on. All right. So if you were in a, a member guest and you're playing playing a, with, with a friend of yours and, and they're going to play a song over the loudspeakers as you walk up onto the first tee, what song are you going to have them play? You know, songs roll around in my head all the time. Um, and so... Um... You know, I've, I've got I've got people that I consider to be, you know, some of my favorite artists, but my still my all time favorite country and Western artist is the late, great Keith Whitley. So I, he played I'm No Stranger to the Rain. That would not bother me at all. I'm no stranger in the rain to the rain to the rain. Cool. I haven't heard that. So I'll, I'll look that up and check that song out. Um, You had a very interesting career, very well respected and very successful. and. Let's say Hollywood calls you and they say, Doctor, we've been watching your career. We find it very interesting and we're going to make a movie about it. And we're going to let you select the actor who, who portrays you in this movie. Who are you going to have him select? Man, I don't know. Um, Tom Hanks. He'd be a pretty good one. It's hard to argue against Tom Hanks and his, his list of uh, roles. Um, be interesting to hear your answer on this one. Your favorite purchase in the last year under. Five hundred dollars. Ah, maybe just a couple of weeks ago, purchased a um, a drone that can um, that we can use to take pictures, and so now we can fly it up overhead and uh, take pictures just about anything we want. So we can really evaluate turf grass and and uh, really see differences. You know, used to <laughs> I can remember getting twelve foot ladder. Putting it in the back of a truck, 
having somebody climb up there praying to God they didn't fall off. <laughs> now for two hundred dollars, we bought a drone that could take ten times a better picture than we ever dreamed to take. You know, I, I bought one early in COVID because no one's doing anything, and we're out in the neighborhood, and I'm videoing friends are saying, "Hey, what are you doing?" I'm trying to fly it, and we're videoing the neighborhood, and houses, and kids playing. And I'm looking at the screen, and all of a sudden, it, it, the, it's not moving. And I hear this, the, the propellers just, burr, 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 and, I, and they said, stop, stop. And I ran it into a tree. I had, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> so, yeah. And I yeah. haven't used it since. So it's been a couple hundred dollars been sitting there. Back then, I think that one was about five, six hundred. So yeah, it's taken it out price for sure. If you could put a restaurant chain in your kitchen at home, what restaurant are you going to choose? Could be a fancy restaurant, a, a chain of restaurants, a fast food, whatever you wanted. What, what one would you put in your kitchen? I put a Ruth Chris Steakhouse. Ooh, in that's, my... Yeah, that's hard to. You're you're the only the ironically enough you're only the second one who said that, and I'm very surprised that no one would pick that. Most like Chipotle or something goofy, but right. Well, it's hard to beat that place. Yes, it sure is. Uh, which will lead to the next question. In your opinion, you've been around golf your whole life. What is worse, uh, an overcooked, well-done steak or iron covers? Iron covers. <laughs> I think that's been the majority of people have answered that one. <laughs> uh, let's see. If you could sit in a golf cart and talk to anybody you wanted to throughout history, the choice is yours. You can pick anyone you want to. Who, who would it be? Easy. My dad. Yeah, that, that, that was a long time. I lost him when I was 33. So. That's way too early. Mm -hmm. That is a very good one. If you could pick any of these four golf courses to play, which one are you going to pick? Pine Valley, Augusta National, Pebble Beach, or St. Andrews? Like I say, it's going to probably be St. Andrews. Um, I played two of those. I have never played Pebble Beach. I've played the other two several times, actually. Uh, but ironically, I've never played golf across the ocean there in Scotland or Ireland. And I don't. I find a lot of people find that find that very interesting because of the top 100, I think, I, you know, I don't know what the number is. I've played 72, 73, but I've not played over there. So I think I'd like to play there. Yeah, that'd be a cool one. I, I remember uh, t Tim and I had a conversation one time about technology and the advances and changing and how you use words during lectures and things like that. And I forget, I think it was Dr. Beard because uh, I had a book from his from right. when I was in school. We had to take an agronomy Absolutely. class. and I. I loaned it to Tim for a while and he was reading up some of the, his old material and during the lecture I think he said that the the changing of the blades on the mowers in the 1600s or 1700s was basically pulling the teeth out of the sheep yeah that's exactly right <laughs> that's exactly right uh, a couple more and then we'll, I'll wrap you up and get, get you on your way and go to supper or do what you have some uh, things to do today uh if you could change one rule in golf what would it be taking the ball out of the divot in the fairway i don't think you get a lot of argument there i, I uh someone else said yeah use that one before and i told this quick story i was playing in the u.s open qualifier god this is about 20 years ago and this is no joke first five or six fair, uh, holes i think the seventh hole is a par three so the first six were all par fours or fives i hit it in in the fairway and was in a divot in all of them yeah yeah. My cat looked at me and said, who'd you piss off this morning? Yeah, it, it, you know, I, and, and I've listened to, you know, my guy, my group of guys, we're, you know, that, that comes up every once in a while. And then some guy will say, well, you know, how are you going to actually define what is a divot and all that? Well, for the majority of the time, the game's hard enough. It's really not going to matter. Mm -hmm. For the majority of us that play, right, it's really not going to matter. You want to you want to keep the rule for quote unquote a qualifier or a U.S. Open or whatever. Feel free, mm -hmm. but for the majority of us, doesn't matter. Foot wedge. Hell, the game's the game's hard enough already. <laughs> That's right. Uh, let's see. In the last one, in your opinion, this one's always interesting. Uh, who is the greatest golfer of all time? Who's the goat? I think it's Nicholas. I really do. I I, I mean, we do have this argument all the time with people, and and I think Tiger Woods obviously. This has been as influential as any player that you'll ever see. And, and holy smokes. Wow. 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 Mm -hmm. How good was that guy? But, you know, Nicholas, 
he came in second 20 times. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty that's impressive. Hard to, that's hard to fathom sometimes. So that's my opinion. The, the answers have been largely based off de age demographic. And yeah. you really, anyone 50 ish and over is, because mostly said Nicholas, anyone under is, is lean towards Tiger. But uh, it, it, well, neither answer is incorrect. It's a yeah, and I can debate. remember Tiger Woods starting. I can even remember I, I, a, a funny story is uh, holy smokes. The last guy to beat Tiger Woods in the in the U.S. Am or the last guy to win the Tiger the U.S. Amateur before Tiger Woods won it three times. John uh, from Minnesota uh, was the great Harris. Actor. John Harris. John Harris. I ran into John Harris in 1997. Tiger was just or ninety six. Tiger's just getting started, and John had been Tiger Woods's. Uh, he'd been his captain for the uh, for the Walker Cup, and they'd gone over to England. And so I talked John Harrison to come in and speak in my class. And so one of the kids, I remember this. This is Tiger hadn't done anything yet, mm -hmm. and one of them says, "How?" Uh, what do you think of this guy, Tiger Woods? John says, he is going to do things that you would not believe. He said, now. He leans in and he goes, he's got some social skills he's got to clean up, but he is going to do some things you would not believe. So that was just, I just remember that like it was yesterday. Yeah, and he and did. It, it, that That's somewhat similar to the, the Bobby Knight story about Michael Jordan when they called him about, you know, who should yeah. we draft? And he said, Pick Jordan. Yeah. Well, we need a center. Pick Jordan anyway. <laughs> you know the, the greats like that. Every you know they just know. You know they have yeah. the, whatever it is. Yeah, I've seen them come through as my students. You know, I've graduated over two thousand kids, and so you know how many of them are superintendents today? Well over seven hundred. So, and you know I can tell you when one's going when one's walking out the door that I know damn good and well they are going to be really good. Mm -hmm. Do you have a uh, – you do a school, one-week school in December, don't you, up there uh, in, in Lansing or East Lansing? Yes, at uh, East Lansing, December 9th through 12th this year. And uh, it's a $700 school, and it's aimed primarily at somebody who would be, you know, getting into the industry. And, you know, you say, well, I'm going to be I, – I, you know, I, I can't get to a, a formal schooling, but I'd like to get some schooling. And maybe you're getting a job on a golf course. Maybe you're changing careers, and now you're going to start selling fertilizer, but you, you, you still need to understand what's going on. So it's, it, we get a wide range of people. And um, so if you have an interest in that, um, we, you can send a, an email to uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kevin Frank, easy email, Frank K, F-R-A-N-K-K, -K, at msu.edu, and we can get you set up and they're going to have to put up with about three hours of lecture from me, but at the same time, uh, we'll, uh, you think you'll have a great week. I will have, uh, is there a, um, a link to that at all online? Yes. yes. Okay. If you would email that to me, when I put your summary together, I have a link yeah. to that and where people can find you and reach out to uh, Dr. Sure. Frank and register for that and hopefully get you a few, a few people up and, they can learn some more. If they yep. didn't learn enough today, I mean, we, we could, like you said, we could have talked for days on different things. And I wish we had a lot more time uh, because it's been very interesting. I really appreciate this. And thank very you for welcome. coming on. Very, very well, if you hang out for a minute, everybody, thanks for tuning in. We'll check you out next time.